I want to talk to you about something about 10 days ago. I got a call from Ari. He was on a plane and uh, he was calling me to say goodbye that he was going to Australia to do a tour. And he said that he might see me in two weeks and he got a return ticket uh, to L.A. in two weeks just in case Mitzi Shore died. And I go, what do you mean? And he goes, yeah, she's not in good shape. She's not doing well. I hung up the phone with him and I sat down and and it was weird. I haven't seen Mitzi in maybe uh, nine years, you know, ten years or something. I haven't seen Mitzi. But once he said that to me, uh, you know, I just started thinking that that whole weekend I I was in Albuquerque with Dean Delray at the Santa Ana Casino, which is great people. Uh, but just the thought of what Mitzi meant to me, you know, like at that, that whole weekend, I thought about it. Just little things about the store and stuff. And last week, we did a podcast about, you know, people who get uh, misled. They think that this is just a fucking catwalk. This will justify what I was saying last Sunday and why I'm the way I am. Uh, in 1995, I left Colorado and I, you know, went on my journey to be a comedian. Did I ever think I would end up in L.A.? Not by any means at all, guys. I thought I was going to be a ham and egger, work like that uh, southwest, uh, northern border of the country, and I was going to hide. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a social misfit and hide. One thing turned to the other. I ended up in Seattle. One thing turned to another. I uh, I got a call, you know, over the holidays. I went on stage, and a couple of days later, the manager of the club called me, and CBS was interested in me. So, uh, anyway, back to the Ari thing. He calls me, and he says this to me. And the whole weekend, I'm kind of thinking about my life at the store and what it meant to me, you know. And uh, if you guys Google it or whatever, there's probably a couple books on the comedy store or uh, stories about Mitzi. I know there's one book that's uh, some disgruntled person wrote and called her a bitch and that they had to go on a strike to get paid from her and, you know, blah, 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 blah. blah. This is my experience with Mitzi Shore and what the comedy store meant to me. You know, in 1995, uh, I only read about the comedy store, like in Judy Carter's book and in other books or comedy magazines but in your mind when you first got into comedy that was the mecca of mecca for catholics it's uh going to rome, rome and seeing the vatican for as a comedian uh the comedy store is it that's 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 the mecca that's the home of kennison that's the home of richard pryor that's the home of andrew dice clay that's where roseanne was uh seen that's where welcome back carter was written that's where J.J. Walker had been discovered to be on Good Times. I mean, the stories go on and on and on and on about this place and what it attracted over the years. Between you and I and Lee and, you know, uh, I never, ever, ever thought I would walk into the chambers of the comedy store, that I would ever be good enough. So it didn't matter to me whatever I heard. Like, whatever the fuck anybody said to me, I would just be Joey Diaz, take it in and blow it out and go, who gives a fuck? It doesn't matter. Like, people go, I went to the comedy store, and they're like, well, you know, they, they let me in for free, and I go, who gives a fuck? Or people would go, I went down there, and I got on stage on open mic, and who gives a fuck? And what happened was, when you're working the rooms I was working at the time, you're working with failed comedians. You're working, not really failed comedians, you're working with headliners who had given L.A. a try. And it didn't work out for them. Now they're back home and they're pissed at people who did stay and something was going on. So you also also heard this negative undertone about Los Angeles. So it's like a, a sweet and sour situation. The whole time you're developing as a comedian, or at least for me, I wasn't developing to be on TV or developing to be the next fucking Richard Pryor. I was just doing comedy to see if it would get me away from a criminal aspect of my life I needed purpose in my life I had tried everything and comedy was the last resort <coughs> excuse me so I decided that if I was going to do comedy I was going to commit to it and I read everything I could there was no internet there was no computer and so you had to buy books and read magazines and 
you know, everything that you read, except like the Lenny Bruce shit, went back. To, yeah, I think even the Lenny Bruce stuff went back to the comedy store. So I'm living in Colorado. I'm having all these problems. I get in my car and I go to Seattle. Again, guys, when I landed in Seattle, in my heart, I wasn't good enough to be there. You know, I had been, for 20 years, nothing positive happened in my life. Nothing, nothing. You know, I got married, I went to prison, shit like that, but it, it still was not what I was searching for. I don't know what the fuck I was searching for, but none of that that had happened had mattered at that point. I was still a waste piece of shit in my mind. I moved to Seattle, and in Seattle, guess what? I started making strides as a comedian. And what do I mean? What do you, were you getting on TV, Joe? Were you making money? I was making eight hundred dollars a month on an average, and uh, my bills were like eighteen hundred a month. And if it wasn't for people like Carola and Josh Wolf who helped me out a lot, and I wouldn't have made it, you know. But because I committed to the journey, the universe takes care of you. When you commit to a journey, the universe will take care of you. You'll find a way. And even if you suffer one night and have to sleep out in the snow, six of those nights, one way or another, you'll sleep on somebody's couch, which at that time is the Ritz-Carlton to you. The universe has a weird way of taking care of you once it knows that you're committed to what you're doing. So I'm in Seattle. I'm getting arrested for this, stolen cars, domestic violence, you know. It just didn't stop with my life. And I'm not going to tell you that life was throwing curveballs at me at the time. I was the fucking problem. I was the problem. Between that and the drugs, you know, I didn't have control. The only thing I had control of was the comedy. That's the only thing I had definite control over was the amount that I got on stage, writing, getting gigs, hustling. I was dynamite at that stuff. Everything else, I was a fucking failure. Everything else, I was a failure. So one Thanksgiving, I get on stage, and again, the manager calls me a week later, and he goes, listen, some guy just called from CBS, they're doing a pilot, and you're perfect, they're coming up the second week of December to bring the whole staff to see you. That was fucking rare, guys. We're going in like fucking Marines, you understand me? Welcome to church, motherfucker.